Okay, great. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today we're having Shantanu Dasu, who's hanging out from the University of Western Ontario, or Western University. Uh, Whatever. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thanks Simon. Uh, good to be here with you all. <clears throat> um, yeah, many of you who know me know I work generally in some other areas, but uh, over the last few years I've been uh, educating myself on this very uh, <clears throat> dangerous topic in astronomy, which is the initial mass function, which <laughs> over decades uh, there are many ideas and, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think I have uh, a better mouse trap here maybe, but, um, and it presents some ideas we've been working on the last few years and uh, papers are published, but also kind of in some state of ferment about interpretation and uh, where to go with all of this. Okay, so uh, I've been learning a lot about the, the IMF, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so just some very preliminary, you know, I might get a bit pedagogical at times, but um, just to set the stage, I mean, most of you know that uh, due to radiation pressure, we think there's an approximate maximal stellar mass of about 100 solar masses, so we can't pin it down very exactly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, to sustain nuclear fusion <clears throat> in a steady state, there's a minimum mass. Again, it's not an exact number. There's a range of uncertainty, but most people take the value to be about 0.075 solar masses or about 80 Jupiter masses. Uh, and uh, that, of course, is the mass at which you get into steady state nuclear fusion. But if you're just below this mass, you still have nuclear fusion. It's just that you cannot achieve a steady state in which the internal energy generation balances the losses at the surface, and it may, may or may not last a very long time. So in this intermediate range of 79 to 13 Jupiter masses, you may have uh, a little bit of nuclear fusion, or you could actually have a lot, but it won't be steady state. <clears throat> and that's what is, on a theoretical basis, called the brown dwarf. Uh, you could have a different empirical definition, but from a theorist's point of view, these are sort of the um, different markers. Uh, and then, of course, if you go below 13, solar, ju 13 Jupiter masses, uh, again, by theorist's definition, you're a planet. Uh, meaning the energy generation in the core exactly balances the radiative losses at the surface. So that's, that's, that's uh, only for steady state, because it uh, won't balance the, uh, the cooling. You can call it whatever you like, but if, we, if you balance the two, the luminosity stays steady for a long time. If you don't, the luminosity at the surface keeps running down with time. Okay. Um, now, this is related to formation mechanisms. Again, classical ideas of core accretion applied to planets. We don't really know that that's the only mechanism that works up to 13 Jupiter masses. It could work beyond. Again, there's a difference between you know, some definition based on what's happening in the interior to the actual formation mechanism. Um, at very high masses, like for stars, we generally think of direct collapse of molecular cloud cores. But there's also an intermediate regime, which could be disk fragmentation followed by ejection. And that could account for low mass stars. It could account for brown dwarfs. It could even account for giant planets. So we have at least these three different formation mechanisms. And of course, I'm focused more on these two. In the case of the direct collapse, won't you be stopped at the larger radius by the distributed area? Yes, you'll form a disk no matter what. Yes, yeah, it's true. Still call it the direct collapse. I still call it that, yes. That's a good point because uh, the idea, the only difference between this and this is that this represents central object, essentially, that ultimately does form by disk accretion. On the other hand, you could have secondary objects that don't form at the gravitational center and um, stay on as a uh, binary star or ejected object. OK, so um, <clears throat> the initial mass function formally, from a statistics point of view, is a probability density function. I'll be interchangeably using f of m as a distribution function, which is also the differential number per mass interval. Uh, and of course, uh, there are many caveats observationally into determining this IMF. 
first of all, you don't measure mass directly. You have to somehow convert from luminosity to mass. And this requires stellar evolution models, of which there are several out there, which may not exactly agree with each other. Uh, there is the issue of unresolved binary systems. If you have a second object that's contributing to the luminosity, but you don't see it, then you're uh, not measuring the mass properly. Uh, if you're doing a field star IMF, general field, then of course all those stars formed at different locations. They could have different metallicities. Uh, they could have uh, different ages. And so you have to somehow take all that into account if you believe that the initial mass function is a universal function. You almost have to assume it's some universal function and then work backward from the data. <clears throat> Uh, so what a lot of people do is they prefer to look at individual star clusters because there you have a more pristine sample of a group of stars which form more or less at the same time, same metallicity, and, um, and you can also see the faint objects well if it's a relatively nearby cluster. Uh, and um, so all that's good, but then of course a typical cluster might have only uh, you know, 100 members or something, so the, the number statistics um, are not as good. Uh, so for the field star IMF, I think I've, I've, this is repeating some things I already said. Uh, so these are some of the, the caveats and pitfalls. Uh, you definitely have to uh, correct for stellar evolution because the most massive stars in the field would have evolved off the main sequence. And uh, people generally assume that the birth rate of stars is constant in the galaxy. You don't really have to assume that. Uh, I guess cosmologists don't even believe that's true. But generally for the IMF, people are, are assuming that to be a constant because it makes the analysis easier. Uh, and so, for example, if you do believe that this birth rate is fun function is constant, then for at least those stars whose main sequence lifetime is less than the age of the galaxy, you can make a simple formula conversion of the number that you actually observe, the present day mass function, and you can convert that into what you consider the initial mass function by simply taking this ratio of the age of the galaxy over the, um, the main sequence lifetime. So that works for at least a part of the IMF, but once you get to, uh, and this is assuming, again, steady state production of these stars at a constant rate, okay? So there's a lot of assumptions. So often you're looking at IMFs, where all, that's all that's been done, but uh, my point here is that there's a lot of assumptions that often go into that conversion. So, um, so I'm you know, maybe more, um, more a believer in looking at large numbers of young stellar clusters and maybe looking at the aggregate of those to get a better idea of the IMF. Uh, as I said, you're looking at objects that are roughly coeval. Uh, we now know that the IMF extends well into the substellar regime. Those objects do not have a constant luminosity. The luminosity is declining with time. So the younger the cluster, the brighter the brown dwarfs, so you're more likely to see a brown dwarf if you're looking at a young cluster for a given distance. Um, right, so uh, then again, there's again pitfalls, and I'm not here to be the expert on this stuff, but you have to worry about contamination. You know, you're, you may be looking at some stars that are in the foreground or background. Um, there, um, you typically assign a particular age to the cluster. You might take the ONC to be one million years old or two million years old, but we don't really know. It might be anywhere between one and three million years. And in addition to that, the stars themselves could be spread in age over that time. So again, those are things that are often not included in IMF determinations. So, <laughs> so if you believe any of this <laughs> anymore, uh, what I'm going to point out here is this uh, nice compilation from the annual reviews by Bastian et al., which looks at a whole number of clusters and associations, as well as field star data here. <clears throat> so, but looking at the, um, at the clusters and, um, and the nearby star-forming molecular clouds like Roof, Orion, and Taurus, uh, you can draw many conclusions. Um, now, what's what? Okay, so you can see that these have been fit by essentially some kind of mathematical double power law profile, uh, just mathematically. And um, the black arrow points to where the kind of the inflection point of the two power laws is, which could also be the maximum uh, if it's turning over all the way. Here it's not necessarily turning down, but uh, you can rough, you know, crudely associate that black arrow with a peak mass. And so one of the conclusions is that the peak 
masses don't vary a lot. <clears throat> And it's also interesting from a star formation point of view to note that uh, Taurus, it's low mean density, Rho Ophe, somewhat higher, and Orion, higher still. Uh, actually, if you look at the maps, they have differences in their core properties, the sizes of the cores, but the IMFs don't seem that different, okay? Uh, so again, you can argue whether this is an arg uh, argument for variations or universality, but but they don't look that different given that the density environment is somewhat different between these three clouds. Okay, you can also conclude the power law tails where you can see one roughly similar, roughly minus one on a log log plot. <clears throat> uh, and then the other side, well, you know, sometimes you can fit a bit, sometimes you can't. So I'll comment more on that as we go on. Yes. Uh, yes, that, it is argued that, yes, especially as you look at the young clusters, yes, you would argue that, based on the fact that the youngest clusters have similar IMFs. These, these clusters are maybe young in age, but not genetically young. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, and, uh, I mean, mass segregation, for example, wouldn't affect the IMF, but uh, if there are ejections, well, maybe. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. true. Yeah, so I, I can't really say, I don't really know what we would expect for a few million years old cluster, uh, what the ejection rate might be. Uh, okay, so, but generally I think people assume there haven't been, it, it hasn't been enough time for significant uh, low mass ejection. Slope on the left hand side change between cluster and cluster? Yes, there's a lot more variation there. Well, the peaks don't seem to change a lot. Uh, of course, it's sorry. Um, I couldn't give you a percentage number. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll we'll have to check. Uh, it doesn't change much. Um, well, it's a logarithmic scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Factor three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it scales a lot. Mm -hmm. But you're saying they don't tend to peak at ground worse. And they right. don't peak at 10 solar masses. Yeah, well, or even one. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're using the astronomer's order of magnitude uh, argument. It's more or less the same order. Um, and, um, yeah, so, I mean, this is a field where there's a lot of pitfalls because any one measurement of one cluster is, can be noisy and there's not so many objects. So. Uh, again, I think it becomes a philosophical issue in the end whether you think the data is implying universal IMF or um, variations in IMF. I mean, there's, uh, there's enough variations that you can see, but then given all the uncertainties and small number statistics, people can argue universality as well. Do you think this was much improved now with Gaia data? Can you do this job for um, I don't know if Gaia would improve the mass estimates, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the membership, right, right, yeah, yeah. You you can you can eliminate the contamination issue, yeah, right, right. So I don't know how big a difference. I guess we'll see with Gaia if it really does make a big difference. Um, yes. Um, there is a recent paper, which I haven't referred to in this talk, by Drass et al, where they claim in Orion a very large number of substellar objects, but those are not spectroscopically confirmed yet. So that, if that's true, if any of those... Um, about 1,000 um, about 1,000 stars and 1,000 substellar objects is what they were claiming. Yes. Yeah. Including planimos. Yeah. But they're not spectroscopically confirmed. So uh, the others argue that you're looking at uh, faint background objects. But okay. if they were confirmed to be confirmed, then that yeah. would be not as expected at the low end of the high end. Yes, yes, that's right. That would mean that the low end, well, actually, some of these are kind of flat. And it would give more credence to, uh, to those, those measurements. OK.
so uh, now again, again, this may be trivial stuff, but uh, because this IMF literature is full of different indices and exponents, just to be clear, when I say f of m, I mean the fractional number dn prime, where dn prime is the number divided by the total number, per unit mass interval, so binning in mass. Uh, when I bin in logarithm of mass, I'm actually uh, plotting dn by d log m, which is m times the distribution function, okay? So if this is m to the minus 2, this would be m to the minus 1. And generally what people are doing is plotting the number of objects that they see on the vertical scale, or maybe dividing by the bin width in log, and then plotting it against log, okay? Log base 10. So these are some of the little pitfalls to, uh, to watch for. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about you know, some work we've been doing lately and then a more recent model. So this is a very you know, admittedly simplified mathematical model to generate a parallel tail that is, um, is actually based on this idea that star formation is fundamentally an accretion process. And the opposing view, of course, is that it's a fundamentally a collapse process with fixed mass reservoirs. Uh, if you take the, this kind of approach, um, okay, I haven't even talked about how it's generated, but this modified log normal power law is um, related to the log normal, which you've probably seen this distribution before. It's basically a, a Gaussian in the log uh, with the 1 over m. And um, the modified version is, okay, these are all constants. It's asymptotically m to the minus 1 plus alpha, where for standard IMF, alpha would be about 1. But it's modulated by a complementary error function. So as hideous as this looks, this is basically a function that is 0 at low mass, very low values, and then makes a jump up to unity at higher mass. So it's like a step function. And so at high mass, you get to this. At low mass, you are modulating the power law. So this is a, a MLP, modified log normal power law, for a certain set of parameters. And this is a log normal, which looks like a parabola in a log log plotting, <clears throat> log log binning and plotting. Um, so this can look like a log normal at low mass, but it has a, a power law tail. And so how did that, how is that generated? Well, there is a, a model you can, um, you can make to convert a log normal into a modified log normal power law. And it's very simple. Uh, you basically can assume if you start with a log normal distribution of masses, and each mass then grows in an exponential fashion with some growth uh, rate gamma, but the times that the different objects grow are not all the same. They themselves, the times have a distribution. So this is a probability function of times, which is an exponential distribution, which has a characteristic rate delta. So this is like a gamma for growth and a delta for death. And uh, the death versus growth will be important in determining the power law. <clears throat> so this kind of uh, exponential distribution of lifetimes is uh, in statistics, that's what you get when you assume equally likely stopping criteria in every time interval. Okay, equally likely stopping leads to an exponential distribution of. Um, and it's independent of mass. It is independent of mass in this in this simplified model. Okay, so just like if you were to model light bulbs burning out, you would find that the times at which they burn out something like this with a particular constant. So with these two very simplified assumptions, you can actually mathematically show that this distribution would be transformed into this, okay? So um, this number one is initial, an initial log normal. If you let every object grow at this rate, the log normal would simply shift to the right because you're just assuming that ln m is ln m0 plus gamma t. Uh, but if you then have a distribution of times, which is given by delta e to the minus delta t, then you transform number one into number three. Okay, so you get a power law tail, and the index is really related to these two numbers. In fact, it is, alpha is the dimensionless ratio of the death to growth rates, okay, or the growth to death times, if you like to think in that way. Now, one advantage of modified log normal 
paralyzed, there's only three parameters. There's a mu and a sigma that are associated with the initial lug normal. And then there's the alpha that's the generated power law tail because of these two assumptions. So aside from even the, the very simplified nature of this model, from a mathematics and fitting point of view, an advantage of an approach like this is that you can fit, um, okay, let me see, I was going to justify that a little bit. I'm going to come back to those two slides, okay? Um, you can justify, so you can say, you can fit, say, the trapezium cluster, the Orion Nebula cluster here. Uh, this is older data from 2002. And uh, you can take the histogram of masses after, you know, all the standard stuff that I described with the luminosity to mass conversion and, and you know, dropping stars you think are, are foreground or background contamination. Uh, you can fit it with a log normal, which is this dash dotted line, which does a pretty good job until you get to intermediate mass stars. Or you can fit with a modified log normal power law, and then you can kind of fit the entire data range reasonably well. And even though you have one more parameter than the log normal, your um, reduced chi-squared is still actually less, okay? The reduced chi-squared takes into account that you're using more parameters. I don't understand how further, so in the uh, first one, how further the point of the line at all, it's beyond the, the uh, I assume it's beyond the error bar, and still you get a chi-squared less than one. This one's? No, the, so they compare with the dash, the, the dash dotted line? Ah, uh, yes, right. Because these are really small numbers, ultimately. It's a log log plot. So this part dominates the fit. OK? That's where your fit is really happening because. So it means that this uh, measure is, it doesn't tell you anything about how it fits this. Because if you get, if you get comparable results with these, then that's right. It means that it's in, the method you've you cho you chosen yeah. is insensitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, it's true. I mean, maybe there's a better method, but it's true that you, when you're using chi squared, your main contribution comes from uh, where you have um, a lot of objects. You could do it differently. Yeah, yeah. Right. Lots of previous work in IMS have basically used the log normal only for the intermediate to lower mass ends and then use a power law like the famous saltier IMF so in the higher right. mass end. Right, yeah. And I'll, I'll show that too. So um, let's, um, yeah, so let me actually, I'm going to come back to those other earlier slides if I remember. So thank you, Peter, because you, you led exactly to the point that, you know, people have generally been manually attaching functions. So um, the Chabrier, well, okay, let's start with Krupa, okay? So Pavel Krupa fits three different straight lines on a log-log plot. So these are officially three different power laws with different indices. And you can do that, but of course, that's not a generative model in any way. That's simply taking out your ruler and fitting three regions, okay? So that's one drawback to it. The other is that it's a five-parameter function, okay? You've got the three power laws, and then you have to decide where to have the joining points. You're not going to join these exact points for every stellar cluster that you observe. So for an individual cluster, to fit the Krupa type thing, you actually have to fit five parameters. And then you might get a reasonable fit. Then Krupa argues that the mass function is universal, so you don't have to fit in individual clusters. You could, but you get a horrible fit in many of those clusters that I just showed. Um, with Chabrier, you, Chabrier's argument is Krupa is bad because too many parameters. Why not just assume log normal? But then you're going to add one solar mass. There's a bit of a kink here. It's hard to see. You join it manually with the um, South Peter IMF. But again, you can do that maybe for the field star data if you measure it once. But if you're measuring different clusters, you can't fix the joining point to be one solar mass every time. So the joining point is your fourth parameter along with the two of the log normal and the power law index. So with, uh, with the MLP, aside from any generative model, which is very simplified, just the, the, um, the utility of fitting with the fewest number of parameters um, comes in. So with three parameters, you can get as good or better a fit than you could with the four or the five. So that's one of my points. Um, in this case, I'm showing the MLP fit to the trapezium that I showed earlier, but I could just uh, fit Chabrier, for example, if I wanted. So you can get essentially the same fit with three parameters instead of four. 
Now, back to actually some physics, okay? So, interesting things about if you fit the Chabrier, the, uh, in log space, when you're plotting m times the distribution function, the peak is at about 0.2 solar masses. However, the actual probability function, um, I mean, there's, I don't have a number for that, but it's, uh, there are significant error bars, there's no doubt. I'm not showing those. The, num the, number, of, the number of parameters is not the only criterion. The criterion is like what, what is the predictive power. And this will come, this will come to play when you calculate the, the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. The predicted power? Yeah. Power law. Now it could be that with a certain fit you would get, um, so when you, when you try to calculate error based on this fit, then you would get, the, yes. the measurement there, you would get errors on the Right, you numbers. would, right. Okay. What, so I'm so wondering how would it change instead of, it's, right, you measure, you have, you assume that the value is, is over here, but there's an error bar. How would this change if, if it was several cells inside the error bar? So right. Yeah, I can't give you that number right now. So I, I would venture to say it's, I mean, whether you're fitting Chabrier or MLP in this region, it's a similar function you're fitting, right? So, so you mean how sensitive the fit is to changes in the, in the parameters? Yes. No, in, in the, the right numerical observation, observation comes with a certain error bar. So they, it could be that the actual value is in some, something else, not in the middle of the error bar, something else. So if you perturb all of these, you can, you can get an estimate for how, how the uh, inferred values would change. But just of the mm -hmm. uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So I, I don't have those numbers with me, sorry. Um, but definitely, I mean, yeah, this is, this is hiding the fact that it's very noisy data, right? Uh, at both ends, for different reasons. Um, the probability function itself, not m times the probability function, has a much lower peak. So that's an interesting point I want you to uh, keep in mind. The, uh, the log the peak in log space is often very similar to the average, but the actual peak of the probability function is, is usually at a lower mass, which can be in the substellar or substellar limit regime. Okay? So in addition mm -hmm. to the peaks, there's also the question of you know, which mass divides half of the... A half and a half of the mass, right. Good. Right, good, good. And that... Right. Yeah, and that's right about here. That's right about here, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a, right about at one solar mass, yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah, most of the IMF fits over the years, whether it's Chabrier or um, Miller and Scalo and all, I think uh, they more or less all conclude it's roughly one to one. Uh, so that's, that's a good point. Between one solar mass above and below. Um, Okay, so another point is substellar objects are numerous. Even in the Chabrier fit, it's about uh, almost 25% of the objects would be substellar. Uh, okay, now I'm just going to uh, go back and just justify a couple of points about the exponential growth law because that really we don't think applies to all stars, but it's kind of a, a, um, a simple approximation to get an analytic result that at least has some basis in cluster forming simulations where you form uh, the overall collapse of a large amount of molecular gas and uh, you evolve the accretion for a long time onto central sink cells. There's lots of inaccuracies possible here, but one kind of generic result that uh, Wang Li, Abel, and Nakamura showed is that if you focus in on the sinks that end up gathering the most material and become the most massive stars, their accretion rate, mass accretion rate, does tend to rise with time. So these are different models. This is the one that collapses strongest, and this is the one that collapses weakest, and the dotted and da solid lines are the same model, but different groups of stars. So all I want to get across here is that there is a generic rise in accretion rate with time at least for the more massive objects that ultimately form. Um, and of course, I'm here for Peter's uh, defense tomorrow. So Peter and Chris have a very nice paper where they studied this kind of scenario in a semi-analytic form. OK, this is a simulation. And um, again, there's a lot more to be learned here. But I think we can safely argue, not just with simulations, but even from observations, that uh, if you're going to form the ONC where you've got 
10-ish solar mass stars and 0.1 solar mass, mass-ish stars. They differ by a factor of 100 in mass. If they all formed at the same accretion rate, they would be a factor of 100 age spread. Okay, we know that's not true. So the more massive objects need to form at a more rapid rate than the lowest mass objects. That much we can at least say. Um, now, the other view that I'm not working in, you know, is that uh, the core mass function determines the initial mass function and each star is a direct collapse of a core which might result in one or up to two or three stars at most maybe. And these ideas from uh, Padawan, Nordlin, Hennebel, Chabrier, in fact these plots look remarkably the same, <laughs> at least qualitatively. And the idea is that um, you can create a um, probability density function of masses that are collapsing by having turbulent fluctuations which give you the tail, but then the idea is that the peak is set by a kind of a genes mass, uh, and below the genes mass objects can't collapse, so you get less and less of them. So there should be a rapid fall off on the other side of the genes mass in these theories. And um, it's also hard to even get to the peak of the IMF, which is about, you know, even let's say 0.2 solar masses to be generous. Uh, in log-log space, uh, but that's still much higher than your typical genes mass in a molecular cloud. It's hard to squeeze a genes mass down to a tenth of a solar mass or below, and of course you can do it with very focused turbulent pressure, but it has to be very focused. And it becomes increasingly difficult to explain a large substellar population, let alone the very low mass stars, uh, through this kind of approach. And so this might be I would say more strong in arguing for the very large cores, which form very large mass stars, if, if those indeed form by direct collapse. It's, well, uh, yes, I mean, but, I mean, fragmentation of what? Of the disk, maybe, or something, right? Right, right, so, um, if, but if the low mass stars are coming from the collapse of these objects, that's a diff yeah, you're right, that, but that's a different model than what they're presenting, which is that the entire thing is explained by turbulent fluctuations. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I've done this, and so again, now if I look at the MLP fit to the 2002 ONC data, Again, the peak of, in log space is 0.25 solar masses, but the peak of the linear mass binning is, is right at the substellar mass limit. So again, I think there's something here that this number, or even the, the average of these numbers, is not far from the substellar mass limit. Okay. Um, all right, so again, for the, uh, for the modified log normal, Yes, mathematically, I'd say it's nicer because you're fitting with fewer parameters and you can get as good a fit or better. Um, you have a little bit of a formation scenario. You have a deterministic growth model, so it's not purely uh, stochastic. You know, if you're appealing to log normal IMF, it's purely stochastic and, and literally there's an infinite number of parameters is what you're saying, right? That there's a large number of effects that go in and uh, in the end, you get a log normal, okay, from the central limit, due to the central limit theorem of statistics. Here, we've added a bit of determinism, uh, but then again, there's a kind of a statistical model for the accretion termination. And um, what, to make the model fit the data, you end up getting, well, because we know the data gives alpha of about one, that means that for this model to be working, you know, these two time scales have to be similar. Okay, you could intuitively argue that, but again, we don't have a formal proof that they have to be similar, that the, the growth and termination times are, um, are related. Um, okay, but there's no, in the MLP, there's no model for the peak. The peak is being inherited from the underlying log normal. You start with a log normal that has a peak, and then you evolve, and the peak may actually move a little bit, but whatever it is in the end is coming from that initial peak that was put in. And that's a log normal. So we're still stuck with maybe the infinite uh, number of parameters for the initial conditions. Okay, so again, this talks in a ramble a little bit, I'm sorry, but uh, so just going through my evolution of thought here. Uh, and 
one thing is that if you look at some of the data, in fact, I've shown you some already, but some of the data show, implies a power law at the low mass end as well. Okay? And uh, so we saw that in the Bastian multiple clusters plot. But this interesting paper by Dario et al, 2012, again looking at the ONC. <clears throat> and uh, remember I pointed out that there's actually a lot of uncertainties due to the stellar evolutionary tracks, particularly at low mass. And then there's competing models out there, and they give you different results. So they showed an interesting thing, that if you use these, uh, these uh, tracks of Isabel Baraf and collaborators, you get one kind of low mass IMF. So this is, um, yeah, so looking around here. But if you use the Dantona and Mazzatelli, so let's um, just pick one of these two pairs of three, OK? So in, the only difference between the left and right is they also show a Krupa type IMF here, and they show a Chabrier type here. So just ignore it. Just pick, let's pick this one. Uh, so, um, and let's just compare these two. So with Baraf tracks, you get kind of this shape. With Dantona Mazzatelli, there's kind of a more sudden departure into some, you, you can literally take out your ruler and draw two straight lines. So this just illustrates all the uncertainties, not only between evolutionary tracks, but also uh, these are both assuming a certain age, which I don't remember, but again, if, with the ONC, if you assume one million years or three million years, you actually get significant difference. So, so there's all of these, but there is some evidence that it's not necessarily a log normal at the low end. And, and again, now if you come back to Bastian et al., yeah, if you look at, essentially they just mathematically fit a double power law. And so you could argue, looking at this too, that maybe there's no need to think in terms of log normal. Uh, so with that kind of provocative thought, we were trying to see how we could understand uh, low mass power law, if there was one, in the context of the MLP kind of growth and termination model. OK? Except that the slope's all over the place. That's right. That's right. Doesn't seem like there's a universal slope, right? And um, a, a generative model doesn't have to also assume a universal IMF. In other words, if you have a generative model, you could have different ratios of time scales in different um, star forming clouds. OK, so we tried to move away from the reliance on the log normal initial condition. And um, in doing so, maybe um, get a better model for, or get a model at all for the peak of the IMF. And clearly, one of the weaknesses in the MLP model is the early time accretion. I mean, the early time accretion may not even look like exponential growth. Um, but um, so anyway, we're making one, one change at a time. Uh, and so now back to some physics again. We noted from previous results, as well as some results we have on the next slide, that uh, in many simulations, now back to, like, I showed you this Wang Li, Abel, Nakamura cluster forming simulation. Bait et al. is another set of cluster forming simulations using SPH. And they've generally claimed for a long time that uh, when they find low mass objects in their IMF, okay, very poor statistics, you can see here, but you don't have to believe that this, any of this is fit by Chabrier or Krupa, but the point is they get a significant number of objects well below 0.1 solar masses, and they attribute them to ejected brown dwarfs. That is that uh, these are not direct collapse objects, but rather uh, objects that formed within some disk, perhaps, and um, then in mul a small multiple system, and then got ejected. Okay, So maybe one core that's larger is creating, among other objects, a low-mass object that gets ejected. But their simulations don't have the resolution to be Because they don't follow the dynamics in a sufficiently high accuracy. So they can't say anything about ejected objects in close encounters or in Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to argue with you. That's probably true. But they do get some ejections, whether it's for numerical reasons or not, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think uh, 
it, it may not be the actual physical effect, um, but they are forming small multiple systems. And we know small multiple systems can lead to ejection. So in a broader sense, whether it's in their simulations getting it for the right reason or not. Uh, on, on that point, is it possible to do a higher order integration with uh, fluid dynamics? Sure. Yeah, you can combine fluid dynamical calculation with the high order direct and what mm -hmm. you could do. You could do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Right. The, right. In, in their integration scheme, that would be a second order. Okay. And, and share time stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can. Okay, fair enough. Uh, then let me plug our work. <laughs> so, so we did some gas dynamical calculations focused only on a collapsing core, so not the large scale cloud. And in such simulations, when you form a disk, if you can resolve the disk in the early phase, there's gravitational instabilities. And the tumor instability can give you multiple clumps out of which sometimes uh, low mass clumps can actually get ejected because you have a multiple system. Uh, and so, you know, each of these clumps is resolved by, you know, tens of cells, you know, 10 to 40 cells. Uh, this one would be much more. So, so this is AMR? Uh, no, this is a fixed grid that's non uniform. Okay. Uh, so, we've seen in these uh, early disk evolution simulations also that you can eject low mass objects at early times. So now trying to tie it all together, a little bit of physics into a mathematical model. Um, let's start with the idea that we don't have a log normal to begin with, that it's really just a delta function. But all I'm doing is I'm shrinking the width of that log normal down to zero. Okay, so I'm not really changing the MLP model yet. If the initial distribution is just a delta function, then the MLP is just a pure power law. Okay, this part is gone. Okay, so we'd get a pure power law if we started every object at a very low negligible mass. And we know from star formation simulations that in the end, even if you have a large core, what you start with at the very center that's hydrostatic is a second stellar core, which is about 10 to the minus three solar masses. And then it has to accrete the rest of the core, even if the core is falling into it. But it, then again, it may not directly fall in, right? It may have to go through a disk and all kinds of funny things happen along the way. So if you take this view that you're starting with these second stellar cores, which I'm gonna effectively now mathematically model that as a delta function at such a low mass that I can ignore what the value actually is. And then every object is growing according to this growth, limit, uh, growth law. Um, and now every object is growing, but what about the termination? I've argued now that accretion can be terminated by ejection from low mass system. So what if there's two mechanisms for terminating accretion? Could be that you're simply ejected. By definition, you're a very low mass object if you're ejected from a small multiple system. But if you live a bit longer, you may actually initiate nuclear fusion. And if that's the cause for outflows, you can, again, loosely refer to another mechanism, maybe outflows, as the ultimate termination mechanism. So with the idea that there's two different mechanisms, and one is a lower probability, and the second one, which kicks in at a later time in mass, is a higher probability. You can actually uh, make the accretion stopping probability rise from negligible value initially up to a terminal value. So associate that with outflows, let's say. And if you have only a low accretion termination probability at early times, then that MLP is modified. Okay, it's modified one more time. Okay, you've already modified it to get the MLP. And the new element is this time scale, eta inverse, which is related to the rate eta at which you transition from the first kind of termination, let's say ejections, into the second, uh, perhaps outflows. So eta is the new element. It's also a time scale. I know this is a hideous formula but it's analytic, <laughs> and <laughs> if you get out your pencil and paper and remember that Kosh and Tanch are basically 
sums of exponentials, uh, then you can um, show that at large, so there's, again, there's three parameters. Um, and remember, just intuitively, if we go back to the Bastien data, you, we all know that you really just need three parameters to fit this, right? You just need the index, the index, and the peak. That's all you need. You don't need the four or five of the Chabrier or Krupa functions. Um, so as hideous as this is, this is asymptotically m to the minus one plus alpha, just like the uh, Zalpeter or the asymptotic MLP. But on the low mass end, an ms then is the characteristic peak mass, okay, in all of this. And it's also essentially the region at which you're making in mass space where you're making the transition from one stopping criteria, stopping mechanism to the other. So uh, mathematically, it's a very nice interpretation. Something's changing at this mass, and um, you're going from a low probability of stopping into a higher one. And that alone, that little twist, is enough to get you a double power law profile, which is, again, as nasty as this looks, this is basically a double power law with a peak at MS. And um, the asymptotic power law at high mass is exactly the same as the MLP. It's the ratio of death rate to growth rate, the ultimate death rate to growth rate. But now you have a new dimensionless parameter, which is the transition rate to the growth rate. Okay, the transition from one stopping mechanism to the other. Okay, the low probability one to the higher one. So I'm sure there's other ways to get double power laws, but I think the most general thing is it's not hard to get a double power law. Okay, uh, even uh, and and we've done it without log normals. Okay, that may or may not be a good thing. Maybe log normals do have something to do with star formation, but but this is a, a way to at least in a somewhat deterministic way, get a mass function. So now if we go back to the, the Rio paper, using only the tracks we like, because they give us a power law, uh, and do a fit for what it's worth, then, um, then you know, so here I've got a fit. I've, I haven't shown the data points, but they're over there. It's those data points. And uh, we could fit those data points with a modified log normal. It's the blue line. And because the last data point here is essentially where this line is, the MLP is a reasonable fit. Okay? It only looks bad in comparison to that. But there's no data here. Okay? Uh, but if you fit the DPL, then um, you know, it's, it's basically the same all the way here. It just deviates a little bit within the data range here. Uh, and as you can see there, you can see kind of looking at it that, yeah, probably a straight line would be a better fit than a curved one. But there's not enough dynamic range to really settle it. Uh, so, um, you know, so this is an interesting thing, you know, if you're trying to find increasingly faint objects as, um, as people are trying to find uh, in the nearby clusters, uh, one of the ways one will be able to distinguish whether log normals play a role in the um, in star formation is to just go to sufficiently low mass. Uh, we're assuming that these all form through the same overall mechanism, right? Uh, so it's an interesting uh, motivation to um, looking at these uh, these brown dwarfs and um, even um, you know going down into the giant planet regime if those objects are created in the same mechanism. Uh, so that gives us something to shoot for, something to look for. Um, but in either case, um, the DL, DPL, sorry, I'm dyslexic, yeah, it's DPL, not DLP. DPL is uh, also a three-parameter function, okay? So uh, I would advocate that uh, it's better to use any three-parameter function than a four or five-parameter function. You have no reason to do four or five. Uh, literally, yes, you could just draw two straight lines and join them at a point, and that would be a three-parameter function. Okay, you could do that too. But these, um, these approaches give you a little bit of a generative model, so some insight into uh, how stars may be forming. And then you can dispense with the central limit theorem and the log normal distribution for the DPL. Um, and that's I think, makes this field interesting, to me at least, to see if we can uh, 
if we can make progress on that and, uh, and see if log normals are relevant or not. Um, right, and then uh, we'll see. And, uh, the ultimate test is to look out and observe the very low mass objects in the nearby clusters. Okay, thank you. If I define a what? Sorry. If, uh, if, you have, if, if you create a quantum bond uh, as opposed to a as, uh, Gaussian exponential, bond mm -hmm. bond right. diverges at the finite time. Right. So the distribution of stopping time is relevant because once you pass this finite time, you've already agreed all there is to agree. Okay. So like, how uh, how like how, how are you so so certain that the uh, growth is uh, is uh, exponential, not or the only Gaussian? Well, I think the exponential is an approximation for a lot of things that are happening, but I do not think it's Bondi at all. No, I think Bondi is completely wrong for star formation. It's not always what I'm saying. It could be that in, 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 solar, solar, in formation of solar systems, it's not a probability of solar dark. The thing is, if you're, forming a, if you're looking at the, the accretion of a hydrostatic core, it's accreting from a dense core that's self-gravitating. So Bondi is out completely. So you're, you're, uh, and so the question is, how do you accrete from self-gravitating gas? Uh, one theory is that it's more or less constant if the temperature is constant. And uh, in fact, I think that's a missing element here, that we're starting with the exponential from the beginning. But at some point, uh, what I really think is happening is that you're transitioning from a roughly c cubed over g kind of um, constant rate, where the temperatures are not varying a lot from cloud to cloud, so it's more or less constant for every object. Uh, and then you're transitioning to something much more rapid, which has something to do with the global dynamics of the cluster forming region that goes beyond the, the, the one self gravitating core that decided to collapse here, or, you know, another one's collapsing there. So, um, yeah, that's my best explanation. But it's an admittedly very simple model, and one can make it more complicated, but in the prices, you get more parameters, and there's the competing thing that you want to fit the IMF with the fewest parameters you can. Again, yeah, well, it's a philosophical thing. But ultimately, we want a physical model, right? And uh, and that will have a lot of different factors. There's no doubt it will have a lot of factors. So the question is, can you boil it down to a, the few that are the most essential? Yeah. What's the best understood about how? the initial mass function arises, i.e., is it really universal, or is it some averaging over uh, some range of initial mass, local initial mass functions? Mm -hmm. that, what? That, that, are, that are particular to... Uh, right. Like there are clouds of a given mass or density or... Right, yeah. Uh, again, you know, people argue both sides of it, but certainly if you look at even low metallicity environments um, or in the uh, clusters in the LMC which are beginning to be resolved, there's no evidence that the power law tail is that different. Um, I mean, but each cluster does get you a different fit. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there's nothing, one should never quote Salpeter to two decimal places or even one probably, um, but they're all between one and two. All the alphas are somewhere between one and two. So, individual sample, you talk about hundreds of thousand stars. How many stars? And of course, when you talk about a body of a cluster line, but then right. the, the end product of uh, right. a lot of evolution, some mm -hmm. sort of mixing process. So. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not even talking about globular clusters so much because a lot of evolutionary effects and you've lost a lot of low mass objects. But I mean, even young, young clusters in the LMC, for example, which HST has resolved significant uh, numbers. So what's the largest number of stars in, in such measurements? Uh, I, I don't know. There was one I worked with with my former student. We had a sample of about 100. In, uh, but only, was only the completeness is only for stars above about one solar mass, OK, in that case. OK? So, um, so yeah, it depends. I mean, you're, you're not observing the entire uh, mass function at that distance. You're just getting the intermediate to high mass. Uh, 
And so really you're just trying to measure the power law tail. Um, Isn't there an argument that goes back to the mass function of GMCs mm -hmm. that suggests that most stars come from large GMCs, therefore we're very rich clusters. So that's statistically where the sun came from, and that's statistically where the field mm -hmm. I mean, the field star IMF is essentially, well, it's essentially a, a large sum of clusters put together, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Of sure. different ages. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was coming from a high, large molecular stuff, but apparently I was thinking correctly. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, it's close enough to flat. Norman's argument is actually shallower than flat. In which case, it is more right towards the line. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Questions for... no? Okay. Great. Right. Thank you.